Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. Clean water is a design challenge. Better housing is a design challenge. And I find increasingly the wider scope for what design is, one of the biggest spheres and areas that design is growing to, is designed for social impact and helping fundamentally in improving the quality of life. So there is huge scope for creativity, design and innovation. I'm quoting the guest of today. He's the founder and managing director of Interactive Africa, a Cape Town-based company founded in 1994 that combines design, marketing, project management, logistics, and creative production to work on projects that promote South Africa. The company's initial recognition came through the project management for the first African in Space mission and the marketing and pitching of South Africa's bid to host the 2010 Football World Cup, as well as the 2006 FIFA campaign. He is the co-founder of Cape IT Initiative, a non-profit company dedicated to promoting the IT cluster in Western Cape, and is also one of the co-founders of RAIN, South Africa's mobile data-only network. But to the worldwide creative community, is possibly best known for establishing the international design in DABA, which has become recognized as one of the world's leading design institutions through the flagship Design in DABA conference annually held in Cape Town. Ravi Naidu, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you, Mauro. Great to be here. <laughs> So we started with designing DABA. Yeah. I can't help by starting with that, asking you a question about that. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the idea of creating a conference yeah. before anything else, and then that kind of conference? Yeah, I think, you know, if you had to put yourself back into 1994, dawn of democracy, a uh, talismanic leader, Nelson Mandela, and all of us looking at this fledgling nation and wanting to really be part of this gorgeous new solution and trying to find those kinds of projects that would help us in this new nationhood. And I remember us sitting at the office with a group of my colleagues and we were saying that, you know, this is a time, instead of all of us scrambling for a slice of the cake, some of us need to be concentrating on growing the cake. What's the Grow the Cake project that we could do for South Africa? And it occurred to us in one of the brainstorm sessions said that here we are in Africa and Africa's curse as well as Africa's gift is that we've got some of the most ridiculously fabulous endowment in terms of natural riches. My country, gold, diamonds, platinum. I mean, in the earth in South Africa right now is two and a half trillion dollars worth of platinum. Yet, if you look at this fledgling economy then, and we were in a parlous state of inheriting basically a, a, an economy that was in ICU from the old apartheid government. And the problem was that we're too dependent on commodities, too dependent on a mindset that said the value is in the earth. The value was from extraction. And we wanted to shift that narrative. And we wanted to say, no, actually the value is between your ears, that the real gold is not to be mined three kilometers below Joburg. The real gold is walking on the streets of Joburg. The real gold is human capital. We must start to play small store by ideas. How can we become this kind of society and this kind of economy that's really about leveraging intellectual capital? So it was about shifting a perception. And I mean, the sheer economics of it is this. A gold ingot transformed into a piece of jewelry the difference in price is 14 times. And historically, the African problem has been it's just sold the commodity, but not the value added product. And what we were saying and trying to assert, and we beat a path then to the deputy president and said to him that the X factor in the conversion of a commodity into anything of value and covetable and desirable is design, creativity, and innovation. Why aren't we placing store by that? Why aren't we focusing on that? 
that will be the transformative aspect of this economy. So our initial as, uh, idea for designing Daba was let's corral together the best brains in the world, but more importantly, the people who were not primary witnesses, but primary actors in this kind of transformation, who've got cuts and bruises, who have, were right there in fashioning this, who understand the alchemy between ideas into reality. And we wanted to hear those stories and inflame the next generation of Africans that this is the journey we can go to as well, where we could mine our own stories, leverage of our own uh, savvy and natural endowment towards doing this. But we did it in a very interesting way, that we said, I'm not an impresario, I'm not an event organizer, and we always thought of this as being a platform. And we said, we'll do it in this way because of our activist orientation and the projects that you talked about from the space trip to the bid for the Soccer World Cup. The way we constructed this was to say, three days of talking, the think tank, 362 days of doing, the do tank. So this corollary of think tank, do tank, almost made it a very alternative conference that was not just about accessing the best ideas and these wonderful stories from the best exponents in the world, but also putting them to work. So if you come to Design in Darba, you come to share, but you may also have to roll up your sleeves and do some shoveling with us. And so over the years, we've leveraged over 200 projects across the country, which have become wonderful, uh, exemplary kind of projects because we had to eat our own dog food, as it were. We had to do what we advocate. It's not good enough just standing on a soapbox and saying design, creativity, <laughs> innovation. We had to show it in a kind of gonzo way. So a lot of the people who come are not just commissioned to speak, they're commissioned to speak and do. And so over these last years, and we're at the threshold of our 25th anniversary, we've done over 200 of these projects. And they go from building houses in a squatter camp, a terrace of houses, through to being progenitors of Africa's first museum of contemporary African art, which we did with Thomas Heatherwick in the new uh, Mocha in, in, in Cape Town. So, or a gorgeous homage to Archbishop Tutu, which we presented on his 86th birthday on the oldest avenue in Cape Town, a gorgeous arch done by Snowheter, but it's called an arch for arch because we affectionately refer to him as the arch. And, and these kinds of projects have just been, you know, taking the genius out of the room and helping it to settle in community and, and, and start to trigger point uh, other aspects of our society. So it's, it's, it's a quite an alternative platform in that regard. Uh, you were able to put together so many amazing talents, busy talents, talents that receive offers to speak at conferences all around the world. I'm yeah. sure there are a lot of people listening to us right now organizing conferences in many regions around the world are wondering, how did you attract them? How did you convince them to come to South Africa, to your conference, instead of going somewhere else or doing other things? Because we don't do the normal conference shtick. So if you hand me over to a speaker's bureau, I don't talk to you again. <laughs> uh, we meet everybody personally. So we've got a very old fashioned way of doing it because this is a, a collaboration. This is a co-creation. I'm not booking a talk. I'm booking a, 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 a collaboration here. And so, uh, like I travel 150 days a year as a minimum, have to meet people, do the mensch test, uh, you'd pass, and say <laughs> after that, you know, come on, uh, what could we possibly do together? And, and so, uh, it doesn't have the normal conference dynamics. And, uh, and I think our, the, the big differentiator is that we have the sense of mission and it's quite palpable when you meet us, that you know we are here more than putting a conference together. And people get quite taken by that. And, and, and you know people love to be able to convert their ideas to reality as well, however large a name you are. Because one of the questions we ask a lot of them as well is, hey, by virtue of the energies we coalesce around design in Daba, how can we help you? What's your unrealized project? What's that little psychic tickle in the back of your neck that you've had and you maybe, by virtue of us being together, we would help to, to make that happen as well. So we just don't go there with a begging bowl. And we go there with, you know, uh, with a kind of a solutions mindset and says, come, let's make some magic together. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is magic. I it mean, is. You, you build that kind of brand. 
it, it, it's been 25 years now, yeah. you mentioned it earlier. What did it change from the beginning in terms of topics, theme, and what do you think we, is going to change in the next 25 years? How do you see the progress of the conversations? Yeah, it's been our university, right? And I mean, I'm a scientist with a business degree, so I haven't studied design. Design in Dub has been my university. I've, I've seen all but less than five talks that I've ever missed, and they've been missed for good reasons, because you're welcoming a deputy president or someone like so. So for myself as well, I am completely transfixed there and engaged. So it's been the most amazing university. But we started off in a kind of space that we knew reasonably well, which was mostly in the realm of communication, graphic design, advertising, and new media, digital, etc., fledgling digital uh, stuff as it was back then. And as we evolved with the platform, and as design has somewhat evolved as well, we've just got such an expanded scope of what design is and what design is for. And, uh, and so uh, the remit right now is so much wider than it was then. And even in terms of design, sometimes, you know, it could be somewhat of a misnomer because what it's evolved to becoming yeah. is this rather broad church for the celebration of creativity, fundamentally, and so creativity of every stripe. So at a design in Darba, you could go from listening to, say, Fran Adria in his pomp in 2009, and segue to the creative directive, Issey Miyake, segue to a Shigeru Ban, an architect. So you, you, we, we're just equal opportunity celebrants of creativity. So uh, that's become quite a thing. And we particularly, because of our lens and our positioning of a better world through creativity, we look for those kind of soulful people who are actually using creativity to make the world a better place, yeah. to advance progressive ideas. So uh, that becomes quite a, uh, a factor. And how do you shoehorn all of this eclecticism into this one room over three days? Well. The first thing is that we don't have a theme. We think that's a curatorial conceit. We really want to hear about you and your work. The underlying premise is a better world through creativity. All of these talks are connected by the fact that everyone talks about the process, the rites of passage, this alchemy, this journey from ideas into reality. And what happens in the, when you do that is that you just take the pulse of what's going on in the world because you know, we go from 20-somethings to 60-somethings, 70-somethings, so we're not ageist. We have people from all six continents, so it's truly a global uh, platform. And then what evolves is this kind of consciousness that like, oh God, this is going on in the world, and you almost tap into some kind of a zeitgeist, and the themes emerge, and we love that, that the thing is not pre-edited, uh, the outcomes have not been fixed prior to us even convening it. And we listen and this consciousness develops in the room after a while, after three days of listening to this mix of interesting people. And uh, yeah, so it's changed. And I'm lucky that we never went to a design conference before we started this. <laughs> so there was no frame of reference. And, and I think that in some respects was a boon, that we were at this far flung corner at the bottom end of Africa, contemplating this brave world of design at the time. And, uh, and, and, and so we, we've done a mashup of sorts and, and, and feel that all bets are on. Yeah. And you, you mentioned um, multiple times the idea of design to design a better world, to create a better world. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mention uh, when I introduced you uh, mm -hmm. the fact that you are working on a variety of different projects beyond Design in Daba, beyond your own uh, mm -hmm. um, firm, mm -hmm. uh, always with a purpose, always trying to create something of value for the society. Can you tell us more about those projects and your vision of design and creativity to help the world, to create a better world? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, Purpose matters, right? So we get up early in the morning and we pedal very hard because we feel that we've got, uh, you know, a particular sense of mission. And I think it's just really wonderful. It steals you up in the morning. And uh, rather than being stricken by quarter writers and quarterly sales, um, we're more stricken by 
impact and how we're moving the dial and what impact we're having, which, which, is, which is a nice metric to have. Uh, so the mandate around design in Darbo was would be to say, well, let's solve for bigger problems. And the bigger problems and the bigger issues would be like, uh, can design give dignity? Can design uh, leverage an emergency response? So we take design as a source code and this toolkit, and we put it to work to solve for some of the vexing problems in society. So I'll give you one example, and it's a terrible one, but it's something that we need to countenance because you know we can't be frivolous about this beautiful asset called design and uh, we need to put it to work. So there's an area in Cape Town that had some of the worst statistics for violence against women. And it's a informal settlement. And um, they have a common ablutions block and people are largely living in shacks. This area had no lighting and it's in the far flung corner of the city. And we were working with an NGO, a fabulous NGO, it was actually featured in Gary Hustwitz's documentary, Urbanized, this particular NGO. It's called VPUU, Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrade. And they do these wonderful pieces of urban acupuncture to really upgrade the area because it's found that it, it's really assisted in better social cohesion and, and, and helping in, in violence prevention. So we met these fabulous people there who do the most wholesome work including a German expat called Michael Cross who lives in Cape Town. And he says, what this area really needs is lighting. Because lighting here would be a great deterrent to molestation and issues a, a woman may face walking to the ablutions block, say, in the middle of the night. So for us, the project could have been, we could have written him a check. It wasn't a crazy number. It was actually within, you know, the kind of fiscal reach of even a design in Darba. So we could have written them a check. But instead, we thought, well, this is something that is a story that we need to share. We need to shift consciousness about it. We need to change behavior. And we need to engage. And so we worked with a famous, famous street artist in South Africa called Faith 47, lovely woman. And on the main arterial road outside Cape Town on the way to the airport, on a massive building, Faith uh, made this mural. But then with a South African interaction design agency called Thinking, on this mural, we're studded with lights. And then we linked it to a crowdfunding platform back in South Africa. And this whole story, which we did hashtag another light up, to tell the people of Cape Town about the plight of these women in this township. And, you know, absolutely coaxed them to be part of a solution. And so every time a light went on at the mural, a light went on there. And we, instead of in, you know, writing a check, we made it a, a media platform, we made it a communications platform, and we galvanized more people in Cape Town around this and, 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 and informed them. So these kinds of projects we're able to do in and around Design in Darbo because you know, we're less about putting bums in seats, less, you know, it's been sold since 2004, so that's less of an issue, uh, sold out since 2004. So we could utilize this marketing budget or this kind of things for these kind of alternative, uh, you know, uh, kind of pieces of activism. So that's been really, really neat. And, and over the years, uh, what's happened with Design in Dava is that, you know, as we've got more momentum, and scale, uh, the ambitions have become larger. And so they become sometimes architectural and, uh, and, and uh, impacting an entire precinct. So uh, those things have been really, really neat. But for me, more than ever, the focus is really about the projects. Yeah. Uh, the conference is beautiful and I'm not, it's, it's just a joy and I'll never miss it for anything. And it's just beautiful. But the emphasis has long moved over yeah. into the do tank aspect of it. And at any point in time, we write like right now, we've got like a roster of 19 projects at various stages in its progression. So that's the kind of thing that keeps the continuity. Because if you're just an event, you're a circus, you assemble people together, and then everyone goes off to their day job subsequently, our team stays on, and that event becomes a manifesto for the activity for the next year. Yeah. 
it defines our actions for the next year. It, it's a conference with a purpose and it's a platform and I really love right. that approach. Yeah. You know, the more I listen to you, I remember the first time I met you we had, and, and we had lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking this back then and I'm thinking this now listening to you. You remind me of a renaissance man, you know, between a mecenate and the actual innovator. Mm -hmm. uh, you connect people, you find resources and you make things happen, but always from your first projects with this idea of doing something that nobody ever did before. Yeah. That is really the approach, the mindset of an innovator. Mm -hmm. You know, in PepsiCo right now, mm -hmm. we are investing a lot on innovation, try to figure out really to, how to take it to the next level. Yeah. So what is your definition of innovation? Uh, it's like my definition of, okay, let's go back a few steps, right? Uh, it's, you know what, I use words like design, creativity and innovation inter interchangeably. I think innovation's got more currency in a corporate boardroom, but I think it's, it, it all comes from the same space. And, 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 and the, the, it all is released from, you know, from creativity. But I think I like design definition to be that skill of facility to improve the quality of life. That would be what design would be. Uh, and ultimately a designer would be somebody who would take you from your current situation into your new desired situation. And anybody who takes you on that journey, I reckon, is a designer. So I have a really a wide uh, uh, scope for what a designer is. And in terms of innovation, it's, it's a kind of uh, process and a mechanism that companies and people could use. And it's quite a, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, people have different methodologies for it. And it's, of course, it's got uh, quite a bit of cachet right now with lots of design consult consultancies around the world selling you their own proprietary process to how this happens. <laughs> but it's really a, a, a process and a technique of, uh, you know, creating the new, of making connections between disparate things to provide a whole new uh, solution. But it's, it's, it's people who are super solutions oriented and wanting to solve for the kind of vexing problems of the day, the crisis du jour. And, uh, and, and the fundamental thing, which was why I think design has such a, wo a wonderful capacity, is that, and why I like it more than perhaps the more consultancy-like design thinking uh, ideas, is that designers They, they, they get by by doing. It's a doing discipline. Yeah. It's a lean forward, make it happen. You know? So if you gave me a brief about something, my first response would be to go and make something and says, Mara, do you mean like this? Prototype number one, you know? Uh, and, and you'll say, no, no, no. I thought it was, how about just making those edges a bit more curved? I don't think that works so nicely. I'll go back, I'll come back and says, Mara, do you mean like this? And I, I just love the fact that is not paralysis by analysis. It starts off by, doing. by doing and starting with variations of what the answer could possibly be and this hyper iterative way of doing. And I, 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 I'm a doing kind of person, you know, think tank, do tank. And so I think design is such an important discipline to have because I think even in my country, we have a problem because we write poetry in terms of policy you can't argue with the scholarship of what these politicians write because it's right. But then there's an implementation deficit. We can all write the right things, but to do it is a whole nother thing. And so we were, I think we, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy in understanding how to do. Lots of people say the right things. Yeah. And there is a lot of conversation, you, you mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. on the process behind innovation mm -hmm. and many entities, firms, agencies that sell you this idea of their process. Seven and blocks. <laughs> you follow this journey. And the reality is that innovation is really about the people and yeah. the way of thinking. And you just said it, this idea of prototyping, of creating. Mm -hmm. So talking about people, do you think that innovators, designers have a unique way of thinking? You know, from optimism to curiosity, what, what, what describes the mind of a designer and the, of an innovator? Uh, a few factors. Uh, 
the one is uh, you have to be an incurable romantic. What do you mean? <laughs> you have to be in love with things. You have to feel like, you know, a sense of, uh, um, you know, you've got this positive energy. And uh, I think I sublimate all my unrequited love through my projects. You know, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> uh, you have to be an incurable romantic. You have to be an optimist. You have to feel that, you know, uh, there's a better way. I love hanging out with designers. But one of the best things about designers, can you imagine this mindset? A designer's mindset is fundamentally, I want to make this better. Don't you want to hang out with people who fundamentally want to make things better? I mean, they're some of the most progressive people on the planet. So uh, you have to be a, a, an optimist. You have to be intellectually curious, absolutely. You have to want to know. Uh, you, you have to be this integrator because design is this kind of discipline that links economics and sociology and environmental sciences and all of these things and you must be a quick study you must understand how to you know how to make coherence with with all of these things so i think that that matters as well you know you must be a synthesizer uh, uh, of sorts and uh, you must understand and be comfortable with dissonance and static you must be able to f uh, to be able to deal with that because you, you know, it's a buffeting you're trying various options and you must be absolutely comfortable with that and most importantly, you must be comfortable with failure because uh, in this iterative process, uh, along the way, uh, all around you would be, you know, uh, an institute of failures. Yeah. And Fa failure is something that is so necessary in the process of innovation to try to experiment. It's interesting because the science community calls yeah. failure experiments. That's, That's right. what they are for them. But in the business community, we call them failure often. Yeah. And so I think it's a great, a great blessing because in <laughs> science, I come back from science. And when you did a failure at that experiment today, it's just a data point. Yes. Yes. So how could we in business just consider that to be another new data point? Yeah. And we should be super, super comfortable with that. It's not a, it's not a black mark against your reputation. Is there any specific failure that was a very important data point for you that you remember you're like what well, i really learned something important and then i did something different later on uh a few and i'm trying to find the one that would probably translate and make uh be the best to share um is always a difficult question. No. <laughs> I, because we do fail, but then yeah. it's difficult to remember exactly that. But when you say that, you know, like what, what wells up inside me is like, I'm trying to think like, which was the most traumatic actually? Yeah. It was what, what <laughs> I, and I, I know which was the most traumatic is like, uh, we got completely stitched up when we bid for the Soccer World Cup and we put together this most brilliant project and it was cerebrally absolutely right and whatever, but we didn't sort for the politics. And which was also an issue. Because great ideas just don't necessarily gain traction. Uh, you have to deal with all of these other human dynamics. Uh, if, I mean, it's not always a meritocracy. And you can come up with the idea that hits you between the eyes and you think, damn. And then you go and this is, well, like, how come you don't, you know, why don't you get this? So we got completely stitched up and I remember being uh, so gutted and then we had to pick ourselves off the canvas and then try again. So when we did win the Soccer World Cup, for example, we did it at the second iteration. Uh, and all of that energy from 1997 all the way through to 2000 was just laying waste. But I've got this idea, like, and it also comes from my science background, is that um, my biggest one, and, and it's a personal story, has got to do with the museum, and I'll tell you about that now. But it's like Newtonian physics because it's like energy. Energy is never destroyed. Great ideas aren't either. They just morph and transform into other shapes and form. And you must be... I love this definition. Yeah, you must be open to that. So when we started with Heatherwick, Thomas, an absolute fabulous human being, and he had only ever done one building. So it was early days in his career. And, you know, uh, we had him over at Design in Dubber. And then after Design Dubber, we were told about this particular building in the, in the waterfront that everybody was tiptoeing around because nobody quite had the kind of solution for it. So all of the developments in what has become one of the flagship transformations of a waterfront in the world, really, really done beautifully. But there was this building in the middle and this building 
is particularly significant because it was the tallest building in Africa for most of the 20th century. Uh, Portland Cement Company outside of Cape Town was built and its first project was this. And it was the grain silo. And that grain silo, of course, a great sense of history. It was built in 1923, but it was kind of falling in on itself. It's quite wonky. And, and, and people were worried that, you know, uh, that if it was not strapped in, uh, it was going to fall over. And there were some absolutely cringeworthy suggestions for what should happen to the building. And, and so we uh, started on this project. We put in a lot of energy, got some ideas with Thomas, beat a path through to the owners, spend the time, and this is all sunk costs, right? Nobody's commissioning you. This is an unsolicited mm -hmm. pitch, right? You go in there and he says, we think we could add value to this that you've been tiptoeing around. And then we do all the hard, hard yards, getting a toehold into perhaps going to the next step. And then the owners of the waterfront sell. So you're like left high and dry, all of this energy. They sold to Dubai World, the big property conglomerate. Dubai World goes on, so Thomas and I are back there. Greetings, hi. Got this sparkly idea. How about this? And we get some traction with Dubai World because these things take slowly. People just don't understand the buying cycle when you're dealing with large projects. And, you know, it's not a just add water, instant gratification thing. It's, it's, it, it takes time. And I think all too often I, when I talk to young designers as well, there's a sense of impatience. And, yeah. I mean... Uh, this this entire project took 12 years. I mean, I'm not sure how many projects, you know, we have where you can be at it for 12 frigging years, right? So this is now about year four. Uh, Dubai World we start with them. And then the world financial crisis happens in 2008. And they sell in a fire sale. And then we start again with the third set of owners, which is a large property a company listed in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the Government Pension Fund. And we start this process. And all of which, a uh, lot of the seed, uh, seeding as well, and the support comes from Design in Darba. And then there was this memorable morning where we take a model and Thomas and some members of Thomas' studio and we put it in front of the members of the board and we regale them at 9 a.m. with a story of how this grain silo could be transformed and become uh, a museum. And they looked at it and, you know, the idea is so beautiful and it's, it must rank as like one of the best grain silo conversions in the world. Thomas did the most, you know, majestic work there. So it moved them all and they said, okay, we'll give you some money for feasibility. Let's just take it to the next step. So for that, Thomas made me a little model which fitted into a hat box. And we started to go around to win support and galvanize support, you know, uh, to see how we could do this. And then along the way, uh, the owners of the waterfront commissioned a consultancy in Paris to help us understand and decode this world of museums. And for large parts of it, I thought it was going to be a design museum. I thought it was going to be a design in Darba museum. I thought it was going to be our project. And then there was this very fateful day uh, in Cape Town when these consultants arrived. And so people from the waterfront, the owners, and ourselves at Design Dubber, and we listened to these consultants presenting. And I can remember it like yesterday. And the guy says, there's three things you need to know. The first thing is that no museum in the world breaks even. So the best performing gets to about 60%. And so what you're going to have to do is that you are going to be professional fundraisers for the rest of your life and do understand that there's a huge deficit every year and you need to stud your board with kind of high net worth individuals will help you to shore this thing up because no museum breaks even. So do you understand that, you know, first off? And then gave us the metrics around it. Then the second thing they said is the biggest beneficiary of a cultural activist and designers and all these people bringing this energy here and doing this amazing piece of urban acupuncture in this waterfront will be you, the owners. Because in every single instance the world over, from Bilbao to Tate to whatever, the real biggest beneficiaries 
are the people around it. Because that's what the cultural activists and the designers do. And the people who, who get the upside are the property developers in orbit around it. And then they show the graph of what happens when you, know, you make this kind of investment in a, in, a, in a cultural hub, in a creative hub. And then the third thing they said was, hey, listen, you, meaning the owners of the waterfront, you'll benefit immensely from these guys putting on a harness and getting on this tr treadmill for the rest of their lives running a museum here. Because guess what? They're not going to break even. They're not going to make money from it. Nobody's retired from running a museum. It's not going to happen. So why don't you do this for them? Why don't you pay them an annual stipend? Because you're going to benefit immensely from it. Pay them an annual stipend and it would cover their hard costs. Just take the edge off and they can right-size their organization in order to be able to go and run the museum. But they wanted a bit of a free ride, so they balked at that. And me, in a fit of pique, I got up, I left the meeting, and said, thank you so much. It's lovely. And so ran about 41 kilometers of that 42K marathon and exited at that point. And then into that gap came uh, the person who subsequently put his name on it, and it became an art museum. And so in some respects, you would think failure. And in some respects, we did not get, our name is not on the door. Uh, it's not our museum. But it has become the first museum of contemporary African art in Africa. And with hindsight, I'm glad we're not there. Because I think even if Design Double were to do it, the only way you could make it solvent is to have title, is to be able to then benefit yourself from the platform. I think the platforms don't benefit from all the upside, so uh, which only accrues to the developer, like the fabulous hotel next to it, or the retail next to it, etc. And my backtracking has probably taught me that maybe the model is a more holistic one, where you almost, it's not just about the solitary object, which all too often we make a mistake sometimes in design. We just think about the object, and we're not conscious of the ecosystem around it. And in this instance, it gave me a better view of it. And so we'll, we'll do one yet, <laughs> but we'll do it on our terms. And it was, an, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous learning. So was that energy destroyed? No, not at all. Was it a great learning? Immense. Am I disappointed? Uh, I was initially, not now. And what's the upside? Well, we have a museum. The building happened, it's there, and, uh, and, and so that's gorgeous. So, you know, you, you have to be at, at peace with this, and uh, uh, if, in, if some people frame that, they would look at it and say, oh, you failed. Somebody else would look at it and say, God, you won. Uh, so, yeah. It's interesting. This story talks a lot about something you said earlier, mm -hmm. optimism yeah. is key for innovation, mm -hmm. and having a dream is the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, and also something that is extremely important, I think, is resilience, yeah. resistance. You, know, you just go, you follow the dream, and in the optimism and in that dream, you find the energy to just go on and on and on. Yeah. And that's key. I think it, there's, an, there's a huge sense of self-delusion as well along the way. Mm. I think you need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you need to. I think it's the way that you, you deal with this dissonance. And so you have to constantly believe that's possible. We're also doing a wacky project at the moment, uh, which maybe if there's some time I'll describe to you, uh, which we're doing in the city center. And it's, it's so bonkers, it may happen, you know, and, and, you, and you just have to <laughs> keep at it and just keep chiseling away. And, and, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll drum up enough support to, to make it, able to make it happen. I love your energy. Look, we live in a world that is changing right now. Mm -hmm. Like we are at the crossroads. It's very different than the one of 20 years ago. And God knows where we'll be in 20 years' time. Yeah. And there are a variety of drivers of this change. On one side, uh, everybody can come up with an idea, get yeah. access to funding with the, this proliferation of VC and funds that are hunting for good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you go straight to consumers with e-commerce, with these mm -hmm. platforms. You can build your ecosystem of communication with social media. So essentially, uh, it's very difficult for big companies to mm -hmm. protect 
any kind of product or brand or often to protect any kind of average solution that is, yeah. is not really a, the best extraordinary solution for people. We're entering what I like to define as the age of excellence yeah. somehow. So yeah. that's the positive perspective. Mm -hmm. Then this world is also, you know, with social media and, and the, the platform that the social media is giving to anybody, mm -hmm. is creating also conversations that sometimes give stage to the most visceral instinct of people, sometimes not the most noble one. Mm -hmm. So there is a negative, if mm -hmm. you want, interpretation of the age we're entering. Yeah. What is your point of view on the age we live today, where we're going, is positive, is negative? What do you think about yeah. this specific moment in time? Um, listen, there's some parts of it that are positively scary because I think we, we live in times where it seems to be more divisive and partisan and bipolar uh, than we've been in a long, long time. And, and that's concern, that's in terms of our social contract, uh, that's a huge concern. Uh, the other major, major issue, of course, is climate change and, and global warming. And if we aren't engaged with the biggest crisis right now, I mean, everything else that we are talking about is just uh, completely redundant. And I, I think it's, it's, it's really uh, even moved us to crank it up and try to look for things that where we could be way more relevant in terms of uh, what is the global agenda right now. And so I've been particularly moved of late by, I think the best multilateral document we have as humanity and signed by more nations on the, on the planet. So at least you said if there was some sense of consensus, it was when we all came together and devised the global goals and articulated the global goals and the 17 sustainable developmental goals. And so while we may have some spat about certain routes and policy and whatever, we do know that those 17 goals are what we should as humanity aspire to. So I've taken that as our new rubric, a new agenda, even for Design and Dabber. And I've started to increasingly, even in the way we, we curate the event, uh, and we do this beautiful gig as an offshoot with the Dutch, the Dutch Design Week, which has become the world's biggest survey of the best graduates from design schools around the world. And it wasn't too far a leap to even look at this because these youngsters are already tuned in like so. And uh, they're not looking for a job. They're looking to engage and take Spanish as a system and to be engaged in, the, in, in, this, in, in these issues. And so we put together this platform called Antenna. And Antenna looks at the sustainable developmental goals and looks at how can designers impact on it. Because it's our thesis that you know, the UN, for example, who gave birth to this with uh, all of these member nations around the world, they've had environmentalists, they've had policy wonks, they've had uh, you know, climate scientists, they've had economists, but they haven't had people who have got agency, people who have ideas, and people who have some kind of an innovation quotient who could come in and, you know, do something. So our next project that we are very excited about is with the UN in the General Assembly next year, where we're starting to assemble a cohort particularly of sub 35 year olds, people who reach their prime in this period between now and the curfew for the global goals, which is 2030, and see how designers, the creative community could be galvanized around solving for this. Because as we said to the UN and elsewhere, clean water is a design challenge. Better housing is a design challenge. And so, but you just haven't asked designers to date. So we're hoping to convene the biggest gathering of uh, this cohort of sub 35 year old designers from around the world at a platform we, we are calling Design United that we'll be doing together with UNICEF, the United Nations in the General Assembly. And so all of a sudden, you know, we're wanting to, because increasingly uh, at Design and Dub as well, one of the things we've been done, doing for years, and it's a little backstory and I'm, uh, make sure that I don't ramble. So, uh, besides all the rock stars from around the world, the interstitials at Design in Darbo for in excess of a decade has been our global scan to look at the best graduates from Parsons, RISD, 
ECAL, Royal College of Art, KO Tokyo, Design Academy Eindhoven. So we've constantly taken the pulse of what that generation's been thinking. And we've been tracking it for a while now. And regularly, we're just so moved by what this generation is doing. And so rather than making them, uh, you know, uh, supporting actors in the massive pageant that's designed in Dubbo, let's make them actors in the leading role, which we've started to do with Antenna, and we're going to do increasingly with Design United. But the glitchiness we've seen in the kind of work and some of the projects are just so beautiful, so thoughtful, and almost already at prototype stage. But the glitchiness is that how does those ideas get traction? How do they convert it? How do they let it diffuse into the economy? And so what we are wanting to do with Design United in particular is to create a fund around it because the design ecosystem doesn't really have the kind of support like maybe the tech ecosystem has. So it'll be a, a, a wonderful platform. We'll amplify those stories about this amazing youngsters and their projects from around the world. And the, the, the next aspect is we will help to underwrite them and to say, Mauro, that's a fabulous idea. Here's a grant of $100,000, take it to the next step. It's wonderful, it's a prototype stage, but how do, how do we do this? So we're in the throes right now of fundraising for it because I mean, the UN gives you a mandate, but they give you no money, which is understandable. And so we've been charged with this kind of responsibility in order to be able to do it. But you know, some of the issues around the global goals are fundamental to our social cohesion. So much of it comes from fear. So much of it comes from this massive seismic changes in the economy. So much of it comes with this yawning gap between the haves and the have-nots and inequality, which is also one of the goals that we're needing to solve for and better work. So, you know, let's put designers to solve for those issues and you know, as opposed to just the next little widget. Because I think we solve for most things in the world. We solve for crockery, we solve for furniture, we solve for those things. We need to get to a higher level of I, what designers should I'm be engaged totally with. You know, in, in PepsiCo, some of the most important projects we're working on mm. in our little scale no, <laughs> is, <come on>. is, <laughs> is exactly the world of sustainability and yeah. our beverage and food are impacted obviously by this kind of uh, problem and our design and design nurse can help really finding solutions that are viable, sustainable uh, for the business we live in and for the society and the planet. Well, nutrition is an ultimate food and food security is yeah. an ultimate, I mean, it's a very, very important vertical. Yeah. Well, congratulations, by the way. I, I just think it's amazing that you guys have just dipped your toe into Africa and made your first significant investment in a company not so far down the road from where we are based in Cape Town. So I think that's wonderful. It's and, so exciting. And, and it, it's, done, it's been quite good for Africa as well. We feel quite buoyed by that, that you, know, uh, uh, you guys have darkened our doorway because uh, it's an amazing homegrown food company and I think that you know, embedded in there as well is, is, is not just to service that market, but there's some solutions in there that could go to the rest of the world as well. So I think this kind of bilateral communication and, 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 and partnership is going gonna, gonna to be great. It's a, it's a stalwart, stalwart company that you guys yeah. have got there. I, I totally agree. You know, we, we have a global design function within PepsiCo, but yeah. the only way to really be global is to have local design centers around the world. And mm -hmm. one of the missions of these design centers is the one of really understanding the local culture, creating yeah. value for the region, but then what can we take out of the region that could create value for the rest of the world is one of the missions that we Gorgeous. have. Gorgeous. So am I, be, am I expecting a design center <laughs> in Cape Town anytime soon? We'll see. I yeah. mean, we'll, it, may, it may arrive. Okay, that'd be but, gorgeous. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, Ravi, thank you for being with us today. It was wonderful to be in your shoes today. Mm -hmm. And I have here uh, some Pepsi shoes, sleepers, okay, cool. so that you, you can eventually be in our shoes from time to time when you are home. I want to give them to you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mara, gorgeous. Always You're good to be with you. Take care. Thank you.